Empire. What's up, everybody? Thanks for coming back for another episode of the Football Jones Podcast. I am Mike Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at by Mike Jones. Read me at USA Today at by Mike Jones. Got another great episode coming up today. We're talking untold stories with my buddy Master Tisvasi in a Bleacher Report. And of course, we'll wrap it up with my picks and predictions for this week's action in the NFL. Week 7, tipping off tonight, Thursday night, with the Chiefs and the Broncos. But first, like I said, I'm going to talk with Master Tisvasian. Former co-worker from the Washington Post. Now he is at Bleacher Report. And if you are not familiar with his work, he's got a really cool and non-traditional way of storytelling. And he's got a weekly series where on-camera video series where he gets a former NFL player. First it was Michael Vick, then it was Clinton Portis, um, Percy Harvin, Jamal Charge. And he's hanging out with them in a pool hall, just shooting pool, telling great stories about their days in the NFL, behind the scenes stuff. I wanted to talk to Master about that because, like I said, really interesting. Some of the stories are hilarious. Some of them are very serious. But it's a really cool way to tell stories and um, reveal stuff about NFL players in a light that we don't normally see. So without any further delay, going to catch up with Master and talk about the untold stories this series he's got at Bleacher Report. So, Master, how you doing, man? Great, man. Great talking to you, man. It's been yeah. a, a minute. Uh, good, good reunion time right here that we're about to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, if you don't know, Master and I were both on the Redskins beat at the Washington Post um, for several years. Um, I went to USA Today. A short time later, he went to Bleacher Report, and now he's blown up. He's a big star um, and, and doing great work. Um, so, Master, tell me, um, this Untold Stories series, how did you come up with the idea? Um, and um, I know behind the scenes it probably is not as easy to pull all together. But just tell me about how it all came together. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it was difficult, but we had a good team that we worked with. Uh, you know, big shout out to our CCO, Sam Tolls, uh, who uh, it was a previous idea that existed in BR, and it was a franchise that he, once he was hired at Bleacher Report, uh, decided, uh, you know, let's see what Master could do with this. And so he was like, you know, let's see what you can do with this. Here's nine episodes and, and you know, make this your own and, and really have fun with this and really make this your own uh, your own concept. And so, um, you know, looking at the idea of untold stories, and obviously, Mike, as you know, uh, you know, being as a beat writer, you see a lot of things, you're able to develop these relationships with athletes on a different level, and you're around them every single day, so you're comfortable around them as well. Um, I wanted to create an environment in which you can recreate that same comfort level that they feel, that same level of opportunity to be vulnerable uh, that you feel, but then taking that outside the locker room. Because as you know, it can be difficult inside a locker room to get that. And, and once you're able to get that, it turns out to be, you know, a great interview or a great conversation or, or, or a great topic, a subject that you speak on. Um, so I, I went with the pool hall be, uh, for two reasons. One, um, as a kid, uh, the pool hall was kind of like my safe haven. Uh, growing up at Northwest Rec Center, uh, it was, you know, uh, a recreational center for me that that still means a lot. And I still talk to a lot of people who used to, or especially one person in particular, Gerald McKnight, who used to work there. Uh, talk to him often. And um, you know, you start off, you know, you play basketball, and once you're done playing basketball, you know, you go to the game room, and in the game room, there's a bumper pool table and there's a pool table. And, you know, when, until you're age 12, you got to play bumper pool. And then once you're 12 years old and over, you can play pool. And we would do that all the time for hours and, you know, play for quarters or dollars or whatever we had and just start, you know, playing, playing for money and, and, and having a good time doing that. And uh, I realized that a lot of athletes had the same sentimental experience with the pool, with the pool table, or the pool hall. Uh, as you talk to some of these folks and some of the athletes that we've already had talking about how, uh, you know, they had a, they, they remember at their boys and girls club, there was a pool table there too, or their YMCA or their uncle had one growing up. So they, they have fond memories of that. And then the second part of this is that uh, a lot of athletes, when they, you know, end up getting that contract, they end up having a game room themselves. And then that game room, they end up spending a lot of money on the expensive pool table. Okay. So when I've gone to other athletes' houses, uh, 
typically what, what the case has been is just, you know, going to their house to go to the game room. You know, we're playing pool, we're grabbing drinks, you know, we're, you know, we're sipping on some dark, some Hennessy or something like that. And uh, we're just chopping it up and just kind of having an off the record conversation where we're just, you know, chopping it up and just having a good time. And, you know, recreating that environment uh, was so key and so critical in this and, and understanding that I've seen athletes be very comfortable and vulnerable and open and honest in these environments. So how can we recreate that and repurpose that uh, in a pool hall setting? And um, it, it worked out really well. You know, big credit to Nicole Williams, to Lakia, uh, to uh, Karen, um, to the whole team that really uh, helped and, and, and made this a, a really fun experience. Yeah, and, and it is. It's a really cool vibe. Um, you know, we see a lot of like sit downs. People are sitting in the studio chairs or they're doing a walk and talk somewhere. But this, it, it definitely had the vibe that you guys were just hanging out um, and, and like you said, just chopping it up. Um, how did you come about? So your first episode, you had Michael Vick, then you had Clinton Portis, then you had Percy Harvin, and then the episode that came out just yesterday um, was Jamal Charge. How did you come about with um, these guys? Because these are, I mean, it, it's not easy to get um, guys to take the time, um, and these are name guys as well. Sometimes you might be able to find a scrub guy, you know, or whatever, but to get name guys like this, how, how did you uh, come about selecting them and then getting them on board with it? Yeah. Um, I mean, we had a lot of help with the uh, talent book that we had, but then there was also some relationships I had with a few of these athletes to, to kind of get them on board with the idea and the concept. And to be honest, it wasn't that difficult because um, a lot of NFL guys want to talk about this stuff, but they're not given the opportunity or the luxury to do so. Is you, You're familiar with uh, yourself, Mike. There's a very militarized uh, structure in the NFL. You know, do your job, don't say anything else. And if you do, you, you're, you're liable to get cut and lose all your money because, you know, the guarantees aren't guaranteed. And so these opportunities to be open and honest in the same way that NBA players are, other athletes are, uh, isn't provided to, for NFL players. Um, and so being able to give guys who are retired the opportunity and the luxury to open up and talk about things that actually happen behind the NFL that we don't see or hear uh, or don't, don't watch because, pretty much all we, we ever see is, as NFL fans are the three and a half hours of the game that we see on a Sunday. And so I wanted to show the other six days and what goes on, you know, in the locker room, before practice, after practice, you know, during Super Bowl week, as we saw with Percy Harvin, what goes on outside of the games uh, for an NFL athlete, for an NFL professional, what happens in this industry that we are never aware of and never hear about. And so with Clint Portis, uh, he was talking about how his favorite, uh, his best game that he ever had was uh, a game on which he was severely hung over. <laughs> right. That was the first episode. Um, the second one was Michael Vick and his experience having dinner with owner Arthur Blank for the first time when he was a member of the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, right. The third one, the third one was probably my favorite one uh, with Percy Harvin because he had a, he had a bad rep while he was in the league as a complicated figure and uh, getting an opportunity for him to open up about his anxiety and what he dealt with. Uh, at the time, and you're able to hear his maturity and, and how he's grown so much since he's left the league, and how he looks back on some of the actions that he's done and owns, you know, takes 100% accountability for his actions and realizing, you know, if he could do it all over again, he would have done these things differently. He would have handled his situation in Seattle differently. He would have handled the trade in Minnesota differently. Uh, but he's not regretful for any of those moments because it allowed him to become the man that he is today. And uh, it, it was very impressive to see that kind of maturation and maturity in the story that I don't think we often see from NFL players in terms of the troubled guy who always is labeled as a troubled guy. You never get to see the moments in which they're actually able to grow and, and mature and become uh, the man that they've always wanted to be. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I also, I think that the other thing that was so impressive about that is like as a black man talking about mental health issues, um, that's not something that, um, I guess we're getting more comfortable with it, but um, I thought it was really meaningful for him to to talk about that and, and those struggles. Yeah, it was. And, and I was thankful that he was able to be open and vulnerable about it because he talked about a lot of topics that a lot of people wouldn't. I mean, you mentioned uh, black mental health and his anxiety they dealt with. You talk about him saying every game, you know, he was, he was high for every game smoking uh, cannabis. And then you talk about uh, the week of the Super Bowl, him punching Golden State in the face. I mean, he was very open and honest. Uh, about a, a lot of heavy, heavy topics that typically, again, we view it as heavy because in the NFL, you don't hear these kind of stories. But for Percy, he was just so at peace with where he's at in life that these weren't heavy to him anymore because he he, he had moved on from that. He learned his lesson. And he had gro grown from it. And so uh, it, it was it was great to see that. And it was it was such a great conversation. And it was something that 
honestly, I could have sat down with Percy for a good two or three hours and just talked to him because it, it was so great to see the place that he was in. And, and a lot of people in the NFL who either knew him in the Vikings, which was obviously a team that I covered uh, when I was a, a Vikings beat writer for the Star Tribune, or people that knew him in Seattle, or people that have come across him at all throughout the NFL circ- uh, in the NFL circle, all watched that were just completely amazed at how, how much he's changed because they've never heard Percy talk or look or sound like that before. And, and being able to have that platform in which we're allowing athletes, it doesn't matter if your story is as funny as, or as, as loose and lighthearted as Jamal Charles' story was yesterday where, you know, it's a rookie hazy story. He forgot to bring Larry Johnson's lunch and Larry throws his clothes <laughs> in, in the shower. And, right. uh, you know, it, it could be something as light and loose and, and, and lighthearted like that, or, it could be something heavy and open and, and, and vulnerable and, and as honest as what Percy Harvin was. And I wanted to make sure that the show had that fluidity because athletes are not all the same people. They have a lot of, you know, they come from different backgrounds, different races, religions, different socioeconomical statuses. And so I wanted these stories to reflect that versatility and that fluidity in terms of these storytelling opportunities, because I didn't want to box the show in into it just being a very serious show or a very light show when the NFL uh, encompasses both sides. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what I really like about it too because obviously we're in these locker rooms and we talk to guys and one of the ways that you build a relationship is finding you know, ways to identify with them, whether it's like, I remember back, you know, we're on the Redskins beat, Master was always talking shoes with these guys. You know? Um, <laughs> you know? I was always talking about kids you know, to the dads where finding a way to connect, you know? You're a different generation. Yeah. Master walking in there with like cut off shorts and whatever, you know, and I'm like, what is he doing? And then they're like, oh, <laughs> we paid like a hundred dollars for these shorts. And you know, the, somebody else in the locker room is wearing the same shorts and it's all about finding, <laughs> <laughs> finding ways to connect, you know? And um, that's the great- It's funny you still talk about those shorts because I'm sure it's still this day, your reaction when I was wearing those cut off shorts is just like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> I remember, I was just like, what in the world? But I learned so much about just, you know, different people, different ways, different viewpoints that I even like now apply with my, my kids just when, you know what, let them be themselves, you know? Um, and man, that means a lot, man. Yeah. I never heard you say this before, so I appreciate that. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I mean, my daughter, she went down, we were going down to go meet her college coach and she was wearing these like ripped jeans. And I was just like, what are you in my head? At first I was like, what is she wearing? (laughs) She's wearing these ripped open jeans, um, these bright red shoes. And she looked good, but not for like going to go meet a college coach. But then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I thought back to you and just like how like, you had your way of doing it and then you produced great work. You were able to, you know, and it was just like, that was you, that was your expression of you. And I was like, okay, I'm going to let Sierra do this. And boom, the college (laughs) coach loved her, said nothing about her wardrobe. She's on the team there at Norfolk state. And I was like, that's amazing. You know, so I learned a whole lot from master just (laughs) opening my, you know, um, and I don't know how we on that bunny trail, but just about identifying with players as people. Um, And I think that that's one of the, the, the great things about our job is that, these are really fascinating people, very smart, intelligent businessmen, um, very driven people. The way they take care of their bodies is a science um, for a lot of them. Um, you know, and then, you know, other guys, you know, have just everybody's got a different approach. Um, so that's why I really like this show. And my only complaint is that it's so short. I want you next season. I want you to make it like 15 minutes at least, if not, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Can you get on that for me? Mike, I'm with you on that. I wish it was longer. We're working on it. And I, I hope moving forward, uh, you know, whatever the future of, of this show holds, which I think is very promising and has the potential and opportunity to continue growing and, and, and become something that can be longer form, um, that I do hope it, it does allow for uh, a, a longer format than just a, a three to five minute episode. And so, but I'm glad you enjoyed it, man. And, and I'm glad that, you know, it, it's crazy to see now because, uh, as I'm sure you know, Mike, just the, uh, uh, how people viewed that when I first, you know, started covering the NFL and, and becoming a beat writer and, and expressing myself and, and, and the clothing that I wore and the way that I talked and the way that even that I wrote uh, and translated uh, the, the way people sounded and the way that the quotes and the way that they uh, actually said that the words and, and spelling them in that kind of vernacular. China, China. Uh, it, it was, it, yeah, kind of, sort of, like, you know, making sure you spelled in that kind of way with the A at the end and, <laughs> Um, it was all just a reflection of just the, the 
the way I grew up and, and yeah. my reality. And, and I, I, I wanted to make sure because this, this position in this profession was not an opportunity that I, I even grew up wanting to do. It was something that just kind of, I stumbled across, to be honest with you, my senior high school, my teacher's like, you know, you talk about sports all the time. Why don't you just become a sports writer? Mm-hmm. And in my mind, all I saw on TV were just former athletes. And I was so naive because, you know, growing up with two immigrant parents and growing up in section eight, uh, I wasn't aware that people got paid to talk about sports. I always thought it was just former athletes who, you know, were just doing it to, to remain uh, notable and, and to just do it for the, the, the publicity. And they were just doing it for free. And my high school teacher was like, no, you can get paid doing this. And it just was a career that I just stumbled across. And, you know, there was a lot of things in which, you know, a lot of mistakes in which I did make, you know, in terms of just, you know, learning professionalism and, and these different sort of aspects. But I always wanted to make sure and maintain that I stayed true to myself because that to me was a whole lot easier. And it, was, it made me a whole lot more comfortable um, right. doing the work that I did if I was able to maintain myself. And as long as I didn't feel like I was, you know, egregiously, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, disruptive in a way that like, you know, I mean, I was still wearing a pair of jeans. I was still wearing clothes, you know what I'm saying? I, right. It might've been a hat, but you know, it was maybe worse. I was wearing it backwards, you know, uh, you know, I was still wearing shoes. They just happened to be costing a whole lot more than some other people's shoes or beat riders. Uh, you know, as long as it wasn't something that was just completely just, you know, like I wasn't pulling up in just boxers, boxer briefs or anything like that. It, in my mind, I was like, OK, this this is my way of making myself comfortable in a very uncomfortable space where I don't feel like, uh, you know, this is an environment in which, you know, I ultimately felt welcomed in at first. And so I had to make myself feel welcomed. And, and that that comfort and, and the way that I was able to express myself allowed for that. And it, it's crazy to see now because you'll see, you know, now it's crazy. I'm I'm still only 28, but you're starting to see kids who are coming up or, or you're starting to see people in their early 20s who are coming up and they're looking at me and just like talking about, you know, how appreciative they are of that because now it inspires them to allow them to be themselves and particularly for, you know, other people of color and black journalists and, 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 and seeing them being able to express themselves openly and, and honestly on, on camera and on TV and in, in the writing. It's, uh, it's so dope and it's something that I did not expect out of this. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, what tell me something that you've learned um, as you, you know from the show, from your interactions with these guys, um, just about them, about issues in the NFL, um, anything like that? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing I learned was just that we really don't know these guys, mm-hmm. you know, and and you you try to get to understand them as much as you possibly can as a beat writer, but you only see them for you know a certain a finite amount of hours of the day and. And even then you see them more than, you know, the general public would. Right. And so um, what I started to learn as well, though, the, the, the moments in which they did allow themselves to be open and vulnerable and honest, uh, these athletes are a reflection of their communities. Yeah. Um, you know, as you look at a Clint Portis and, and the community which he grew up in and the school that he went to and he's very prideful uh, and proud to be from Miami. I mean, you look at Michael Vick in the area that he grew up in in the 757 and how he's a reflection of his community. Same with Percy Harvin who grew up in that same community. Uh, you look at Jamal Charles now, who, you know, grew up in Port Arthur, Texas. You know, the, these guys are, 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 are a greater representation of their communities. And for me, you know, growing up and being born in Dallas and raised in Irving, Texas, down south, uh, it, it's difficult to uh, have these platforms where people want to understand and get to know black people from the south. Um, the, the analogy I tip, uh, or the, uh, the, the phrase I always say is that, look, to, to be a black man from the south and have a voice – you either have to rush for 200 yards and throw for three touchdowns or you have to be a rapper. And if you're a black woman, you damn near have to be Beyonce. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but what this does is that it limits our, 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 our frame of mind in which we understand them because all we understand them for is their profession, but we don't understand the makeup and the, and the, and the, the experiences that they've gone through and the perspective they carry that have helped contribute towards the talent that we appreciate. And so I I have found over the last couple of years, especially during my two years at Bleacher Report now, uh, the, how fulfilling it is to look at the makeup, to look at uh, their perspectives and the, to look at their experiences and to look at their communities and, and what they've gone through as people and how that translates into uh, the, the, the incredible talent that they have that we, just, we see on display every Sunday. And I think this allows them and gives them an opportunity to display that uh, in different manners. And hopefully as the show continues to grow, we'll have more and more opportunities to dive deeper into those uh, complex either issues, topics, or fun topics, you know, and, and just depending on who the subject is and what the topic is about. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's one thing that I, I really, I like is being able to show that human side of these guys. I mean, 
we don't have anybody coming to our jobs and like analyzing everything we're doing, or maybe we're having a bad day at work and you're like, you know, you know, why is this guy like dropping these passes? Well, you don't know like what he's dealing with at home, like what's in the back of his mind or, you know, this blown assignment here or, or just the frustrations or the pressure of supporting their families and not just their individual, their immediate families, but extended families and um, all kinds of stuff like that. So I, I really, I can't wait to see all the stuff that you're going to unearth um, from this show. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, so you've got Jamal Charles, who you got coming up next? Coming up next. You know, I don't really don't do this, but I'm going to give you the exclusive because you're my dog. I don't like telling people who's next, but the next episode is Antonio Cromartie. Okay. And he had, yes, he has a story. So okay. a story involving the 2016 season, which Mike, as you're very familiar with, was the season that Colin Kaepernick took a knee to protest social injustice and police brutality. Wow. That's I'll leave it at that. That's going to be a great one. Okay, so tell everybody where they can follow you, where they can keep up with the show. Yes, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Master T-E-S, Master T-E-S. You can follow me on Instagram, Master underscore Tespatian. That last name is spelled T-E-S-F-A-T-S-I-O-N. You can watch Untold Stories on my Twitter account, Master T-E-S. You can watch it on Instagram, Master underscore Tespatian. You can watch it on, on Bleacher Report's accounts, Twitter, uh instagram and also on bleach reports youtube page we are everywhere this show is very accessible you can watch it on your phone you can watch it on your tablet on your laptop easy to consume easy to digest and as mike has mentioned and hopefully i would love to see it as well this show hopefully in the next iteration of it will be a longer format and i imagine that is you getting pretty good response from the guys Oh, yeah. It's been great, man. Uh, Percy's not even on Twitter, but I told him, hey, you're trending right now. He's like, oh, that's dope. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, I guess, you know, we did our job with the story. And I was like, yep, yeah, it was very impactful. But, you yeah. know, he enjoyed it. Clint Portis has been enjoying it. I, I've seen Antonio Camardi has been commenting on the tweets underneath uh, in previous posts. So uh, it's been great so far. And, and we've got this was Small Charles was episode four. We've got five more left. And uh, could have some, uh, some some surprises as well down the road. Maybe something in Miami for the Super Bowl. I'm not sure yet. We'll see. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> All right, Master. Well, I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much. Really happy to have you on Football Jones. And we'll look forward to having you on again, man. No doubt, man. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right, hope you enjoyed that. And if you're not already, go follow Master, check out his work, and catch up with this series. Um, and uh, hopefully, as this thing continues to grow, we'll get more of this type of stuff and it'll expand. Because I'm telling you, every single week when he puts it out, it is a compelling listen, but it's way too short. Four minute clips of these uh, sit downs he's got with these guys is just not enough. All right. So now we're going to turn our attention back to on the field. We've got another slate of compelling games, week seven action here. I tell you what, last week was a struggle. I did not do well in my picks. There was a lot of crazy outcomes, a lot of close outcomes, some upsets. Um, it just was a rough week, but hopefully we get back on track this week. Starting off Thursday night, Chiefs at the Broncos. I feel like the Chiefs are going to kind of bounce back in their losing streak here. Win 28-26. Got to be watching on the Chiefs side is, of course, going to be Patrick Mahomes and his ankle because he has not been the same guy since he has not been healthy. Hopefully, um, he's been able to short turnaround. Hopefully, they figure out a way to support and protect him. Um, we will see what happens there. But... On the other side of the ball, Von Miller is going to be the guy I'm going to be watching. He leads that pass rush. He's coming off of a big game. Expect him to pin back his ears and try to come after Mahomes, especially with that reduced mobility. If they can uh, limit Mahomes, the Broncos have a chance to string together another victory here. They started off slow, but um, I think that they're trending in the right direction. It's always tough to win there in Denver, but I think the Chiefs are going to squeak this one out. Up next, got the Rams at the Falcons. Rams, 
coming off of a three-game losing streak here. They really need to get things going. Jared Goff is really struggling, but the guy I'm going to be watching is Jalen Ramsey. They traded for him Tuesday night, a a big move, giving up two first-round draft picks and a fourth. Traded away Marcus Peters to, uh, to Baltimore, then turned around and got Ramsey from Jacksonville. We'll see what he does. He has been hampered by a back injury, has not played, but they're, you know, we're going to see here how much of that back injury had to do with uh, his frustrations with Jacksonville or if it was legit. But you know he wants to go out there and make a big impact. On the Falcons side of the ball, another defensive back. I'm watching Desmond Trufant because the Falcons' pass defense has really been really awful this year. They've got to step up on the back end. They um, are one of the worst pass defenses in the league. The quarterbacks light them up left and right. And if there was a game for Jared Goff to get right, this is the one. We'll see if Trufant and company can answer the challenge and uh, shut them down. But I have the Rams winning 27-25 on the road. Up next, Dolphins visiting the Bills. Bills winning this one 20-16. It's a homecoming for Ryan Fitzpatrick. Back to his old stomping grounds. They have named him the starter again after he was benched in favor of Josh Rosen. Now he is back in the saddle. We'll see how he does. If he can bring some Fitz magic there to uh, the Dolphins is there in Buffalo. My guy I'm going to be watching on the other side of the ball for Buffalo is defensive back Tredavious White. He leads them in interceptions. The Bills have one of the stingiest pass defenses around. And Ryan Fitzpatrick really had struggled with turning the ball over his first time around as he was starting for the Dolphins. And so we could see him offer him up some more. And this could be a day, big day for White and the other defensive backs um, uh, to have a big game. Up next, Jaguars at the Bengals. I've got the Jaguars winning this one 22 to 20. Guy to watch is Leonard Fournette. He's averaging 5.1 yards a carry. Really having a strong year, easing pressure on Gardner Minshew. I expect he's going to continue it again because the Bengals' defense is really poor. They struggle against the run. They struggle against the pass. If you're a running back, you want to. You're going to have a big day if you're going against them. The guy to watch on the defense on the Bengals' side of the ball is strong safety Sean Williams. They have been, like I said, getting gashed against the run. They need him to make plays in the box, and he also has got to do a better job on the back end against the pass because teams are basically moving the ball at will. The Bengals allow the, one of the highest passer ratings in football. So we'll see what happens there, but I think the Jaguars get the win on the road. Vikings at the Lions. The Lions are one-point underdog here at home, but I've got them winning 27-25. Guy I'm going to be watching, obviously, for Minnesota is Kirk Cousins. He played well against the uh, Giants. Then you said, okay, can you do it against a winning team? He played well against the Eagles. Really lit them up. Now he's got a divisional game. They do not have a win in the division. Kirk Cousins has got to deliver. We'll see how he does. Guy to be watching for the Lions is Trey Flowers, defensive lineman. They really have to contain the run. Dalvin Cook, if he gets going, that eases pressure on Cousins. They want to take away the run, make Cousins throw the ball more than they want, make them one-dimensional. So we'll see what Trey Flowers and the guys do up front. Got the Raiders, the Packers. Have the Packers winning 27-20. to My Raider to watch is running back, rookie running back Josh Jacobs. The Packers' run defense is not as good as their pass defense. They rank 23rd against the run, allowing 124 yards a game. So I think that this could be a big game for Josh Jacobs. He'll allow them to set up the play-action pass, and Derek Carr could have some big plays downfield. But a strong run game is the best way to slow that nasty pass rush of the Packers. Guy I'm going to be watching for the Packers is inside linebacker Blake Martinez. He's their leading tackler, 60 tackles. Um, He has got to, they've got to contain Jacobs, make them one-dimensional, so that way Preston Smith um, and those guys on the edge can get after Carr. I think the Packers win this one, though, by a touchdown. Up next, got the Texans at the Colts. The Texans are slight underdogs here, but I've got them winning 24-23. to Guy to watch is Carlos Hyde. He is coming off of a big game, 116 rushing yards and a touchdown against Kansas City, and he's now going against the Indianapolis defense that is 28th against the run. So I think Hyde can have a big game. Yes, Deshaun Watson's going to do his thing, but Carlos Hyde on the road, grinding it out, will really go a long way to helping that Texans defense. Guy to watch for the Colts is Marlon Mack. 
he is coming back from injury. They're coming back from the bye. Um, you know, I, he is averaging 94 yards per game. He's coming off of the last time, you know, he, he had a big game, the last game he played in. I think that he is going to be back out there making an impact uh, for the Colts. But I, I imagine it's going to be a physical game. It's a divisional game, but the Texans pull it out. Up next, got the Cardinals versus the Giants in New Jersey. I've got the Giants barely win this one, 22 to 20. I'm going to be watching the rookie quarterbacks, of course, Kyler Murray and Daniel Jones. Murray's coming off of a big game, 340 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Um, you know, we'll see if this winds up being a shootout between the rookies or if um, uh, Murray continues to shine and Daniel Jones struggles. But Daniel Jones does have Saquon Barkley coming back from injury, it looks like. They've missed him. And so Barkley running the ball will help make life easier for Jones. Up next, got the 49ers at the Redskins. Kyle Shanahan goes back to his old stomping grounds, but I feel like the 49ers are going to improve to 6-0 on the season. Got them winning 30-18. to The Redskins, they, they got their first win there. Terry McLaurin is my player to watch. He's the only bright spot on offense. Um, you know, we'll see if the rookie wide receiver uh, can go off again, but he's going to have a struggle because he's going up against Richard Sherman, who's playing at a high level. For the 49ers, I'm watching George Kittle. The Redskins really struggle to cover tight ends. They also struggle against the run, so Matt Breida could have a big game. Those two guys are my guys to watch. I think that they'll be very instrumental um, because Kyle Shanahan likes running the football. He also likes throwing to his tight ends, and those are the two big areas of weakness for the Redskins' defense. Up next, got the Chargers at the Titans. Got the Titans winning 20-17. to Player to watch. Ryan Tannehill, he's taken over as a starting quarterback. Marcus Mariota era appears to be done. Tannehill, now we'll see how he can do. This is basically an audition for him for next year, if he could be their starting guy or if they're going to have to go out and find somebody. On the other side of the ball, Phillips Rivers is really struggling. Um, he threw two interceptions last week. Their offense has had a turnover in five of the last six games. Um, I They're just not clicking like they should uh, they haven't been able to run the ball there's a lot of pressure on rivers i've got them falling short though up next have the saints at the bears and i've got the saints winning 28 24 mitchell trubisky is coming back for the bears he needs to have a big game but he could be rusty after sitting out the last several with injury but he's my guy to watch on that side and of course i'm gonna be watching teddy bridgewater he is 5-0 as a starter they are not putting too much on him. He's showing he can be a game manager. He's showing he can air it out and really um, have a pass-heavy game if you need it. Very versatile. Let's see if he can prove to 6-0. I think he will. I will be out in Seattle with the Ravens visiting the Seahawks. I've got the Seahawks winning this one, 30-28. to My player to watch for Baltimore is Earl Thomas. He's going back. The last time he was Seattle, he was riding off the cart with a broken leg, flipping off um, uh, the uh, Seahawks sideline. Now he comes back. He has not played great. Does not look like he has great mobility anymore. We'll see if he can turn back the clock and have a big game against his former team. He does have a new mate in the secondary, Marcus Peters, coming over from the Rams, and they expect that he's going to play. But my player to watch for Seattle will be Russell Wilson. Last time I was up there, he just had an amazing game against the Rams. I want to see what kind of wizardry he pulls off against this Ravens defense that kind of has its issues. I think he could have another big game. Sunday night game, Eagles at the Cowboys. Doug Peterson has got the Cowboys all riled up saying they're going to win that game, that the Eagles are going to win that game. Oh, well. I do think the Eagles win it, 27-24. Player to watch is Dak Prescott. There's a ton of pressure on him. He has gone from a guy looking like he's about to get paid to a guy that just does not look as nearly effective. And people are wondering if he was stupid for not taking the offer that they gave him early in the year, um, you know, when he had it on the table. They have got to get back to running the ball, ease pressure on him, set the play action attack. But let's see what they can do. And on the other side of the ball, I'm watching Carson Wentz. He's kind of flying under the radar. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's because, um, you know, they, they haven't put up as many points without Deshaun Jackson there. But Carson Wentz is having a good year, um, really playing at a high level. He's going to go into Dallas 
If they can get a divisional win, get back on the winning track, that will be a big victory for the Eagles. Last game of the week, Patriots at the Jets. I've got the Patriots winning this one 30 to 18. Sam Darnold is my player to watch for the Jets. He did play well in his return from Mono last week, but he's going up against the top rated defense. And so I feel like it's going to be a real struggle. If he can play well against this Patriots defense, then he is definitely legit and has made huge strides in year two. My player to watch for the Patriots, though, is Josh Gordon. I really want to know what's up with him. He They need help at the wide receiver position outside of Julian Edelman. He's got all the ability in the world. We've seen him make big plays, but he's been pretty quiet this year uh, for the Patriots, and they need somebody else to emerge. So we'll see if he can emerge this week. All right, those are my picks. Hope you uh, enjoy them. I would like it. Um, uh, hit me up. Some of you guys do. I get text messages. I get emails um, arguing with my picks. Send me yours. Email me, mjones at usatoday.com. And come back. I'll hit you up Monday morning with another episode of the podcast. Once again, you can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter at ByMikeJones and on Instagram at ByMikeJones. Thanks, and I hope you have a great day.